So you've got a manufacturing business that's going well. You've got a couple CNC mills, maybe a lathe, but you're finding a lot of the RFQs or requests for quotes that come across your desk or for laser cut or formed work. What do you do in this scenario? Do you source it and mark it up? Do you pass on it or do you send it to another company? What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinist. And today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be going through some of the options that are available to you when it comes to dealing with quotes that may not fit within your realm and how you may want to build them into a manufacturing network. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so as promised, this week on Shop Talk, we're gonna be tackling the concept of building a manufacturing network and why it's going to be a huge asset for your business in the long run. So as outlined in the intro, I see this situation tend to pop up a lot. Um, here at Lakewood Machine, we are primarily a machining business, machine and tool. So, you know, we have mills, we mill parts, we turn parts on lathes, um, we have an EDM wire cutter. We do a little bit of bending, forming, pressing, welding, but we tend to try to stay away from that stuff that we don't have in house or that we're not the best at. You know, we've talked about in videos before, you gotta kinda know your strengths as a business and play to them and try not to be everything to everybody. So while we may, you know, we have a welder and we may know how to weld a little bit, at the end of the day, we're not welders. So we try to stay away from strictly welding work. When it comes to outside processes, you know, we don't have anodizing in-house. So we send anodizing out to an anodizer that we work closely with. When it comes to laser cutting, we have very close vendors that we work with to get laser part, laser cut parts done. Um, you know, when it comes to this kind of scenario, this is very common. Very rarely, especially as a smaller shop, are you going to see a place with every service they need under one roof? You know, if theoretically there's some shops out there that do anodizing in-house, tends to be lower batch size. But if I was gonna bring that in, just the amount of work it would take and the economies of scale and everything that would, goes into running an anodizing line, at the end of the day, it's not something I even wanna look at. So I'm very happy keeping that as an outside service. Same thing with something like laser cutting, where I don't have a laser cutter, we don't do enough to really invest in one. Uh, it's not something I'm interested in doing at this time. So I'm very happy having that laser cutting as an outside service. This is pretty standard. Most shops out there are going to have these kind of relationships. However, to get more to the crux of this episode, what do you do if you're a machine shop like mine, who, when you're getting RFQs, you tend to get uh, request for quote across your desk that may be just for laser cutting or maybe just for bent or formed parts or just anodizing. You know, maybe there's no machine component in there at all. What do you do with this kind of scenario? This is something that also happens a lot. I mean, think about it. If you're a person in an outside industry or an adjacent industry and says, hey, do you know what? I need to get these metal parts made. Well, I'll go to a machine shop. Don't they make parts out of metal? They may have no idea that there's a difference between what a mill can do and a laser cutter could do. Or they may have no idea that the part in their hand is actually a die cast part. They just know it's a part, I need to get it made. Let's call a machine shop and see if I can get a quote. So I do tend to get quite a few quotes across my desk that do not have do not involve capabilities that we have in-house at all. So the question is, what do you do with these RFQs? The first option is to outsource these to your supplier network. This can be a bit of a touchy subject at times, I find, and for good reason. Um, another word for this kind of arrangement is middlemanning, which a lot of people also associate with the word parasite. Essentially, in this case, if an RFQ crosses your desk, you can go and say, you know what, this is a laser cut and formed part. I have no involvement in this. I can go and send it to a laser cutter, get it made, 
mark it up 20% and charge that customer and say thank you very much. You know, it has your name on it instead of the vendors. Typically in this scenario, you're not gonna say, yeah, thank you for sending this part along. I'm going to go to company B and get this made for you and then I'll let you know when it's ready for pickup because then the customer is gonna say, no, that's fine. I'll just go to company B, right? It's inserting yourself in a process that in some scenarios that gets people angry. Um, I mean, I get it. It's as a knee jerk reaction. I don't want to say that I agree with it, but I understand this position. I mean, if I went to go to one of my vendors and said, Hey, I want to get this part made or I need this service. And I find out at the end of the day that I paid 20% more than I needed to because they didn't actually do it themselves and they just marked it up. I can understand the frustration that may come from that. However, there is another view on this and it's one that I've taken in the past. I just say it's the flip side to this. Let's say in this scenario, exactly as it is, I'm a machine shop to stick with the theme of what I keep talking about, laser cutting for some reason. Let's say that there's a laser cut part that a shop needs made. They come to me. Well, I know that there are 12 laser cutters, for instance, in my area. I know that four are no good you know, the same way there's shops that are no good for machining. Sometimes laser cutters are no good. Sometimes anodizers are no good, but they stay in business. But I know that out of 12, four are really no good. I know that four are way too expensive. And I know that two won't touch anything as small as an order as this is. Or maybe, you know, I know this many companies have super long lead times. And if you walk in there as an unknown quantity, they're not gonna touch that work or they'll tell you it's gonna be four to six months. In that scenario, there is value to middlemanning or quarterbacking this kind of situation. Because with my relationship with that laser cutter, maybe we do a lot of work together, I can get that work done at a shop that someone else may not be able to get it done. Or on a timeline that it's not gonna be done, or that it can't be done on. Or maybe, you know, I do a lot of work with them, so they're not gonna charge me a thousand dollar minimum charge. Maybe they're actually just gonna do it for 500 bucks. So in that scenario, I can understand, and I've done it before, where being a quarterback on a deal like this makes sense because that customer is paying for expertise. They are paying for a service. They're getting something they couldn't get otherwise. That said, I personally don't really do this anymore. Um, there are customers where we do a lot of work for them. So on an RFQ, let's say, or a PO, there's 10 items. Sometimes there's one where they want a part laser cut formed and zinc plated. You know what, in that scenario, yeah, I'll get those parts for them because it's part of a blanket PO or it's part of a larger order. In that case, I don't feel too bad about it because it's still getting them the parts they need. That said, when it comes to orders that are strictly outside of things we do in house, I try to stay away from them now. And it's not just for the moral reason of it. I mean, somebody's gonna do these deals. At the end of the day, somebody's gonna do these deals. You know, talk about the ethics of it, whether you want to or not. For me, one of the reasons why I stay away from it now with the, you know, that aside, because I don't feel great about that anymore, is that now if something goes wrong, somewhere in that process, your customer doesn't know that company B is doing this work. Your name is on that work. So let's say again, for this example, we get laser cut parts in. I get them in from company B. I need to give them to my customer and I look and I say, these parts are no good. Well, now I need to go and fight my, my vendor all the while my customer is mad at me because they think I'm doing it. And it's really difficult to say, hey, my, you know what I mean? Like you need to be honest in that case. What are you gonna say? Oh, my laser cutter's down for the fourth time this week and you know, I'm trying to get it working. It just puts you in a situation where you need to lie, you're not honest. It, it just is not a good scenario to be in. The other reason is, what happens then, you know, you say you have a laser cutter in house, or at least you maybe aren't completely open about whether you have that capability in house or not. And then somebody who knows what they're doing from that company, from your customer, walks in and they say, we're getting laser cut parts from you. Where's your laser cutter? Oh, it's in, uh, it's in another, you don't wanna be in that scenario. Again, it just puts you where you're not honest, you need to cover, now you're trying to remember lies and this, yeah. It's just not worth it because at the end of the day, they're going to find out that you're not being truthful. 
that relationship's gonna crumble, and then every company who that company deals with is gonna know that you're not trustworthy. I'm not saying you shouldn't do these deals, I'm just saying you need to be very cognizant of the implications of these kind of scenarios when they happen, because you can get greedy, you can just see money and say, yeah, I'll do it, and it can actually put you in a pretty bad scenario and end up doing more damage than that 20% markup was worth. The other option when it comes to these kind of RFQs crossing your desk is to develop a manufacturing network. And you know the, the easy way to look at this is you have vendors. You give your customer their RFQ to your vendors. You do this enough, you are communicating with your vendors, and guess what? They'll start sending stuff to you. The big thing I see, a lot of hesitation I see with people when it comes to passing on RFQs to other companies, there's a lot of fear that if, you know, we've talked about this before, if I don't take every job that crosses my desk and make it my, my, mine, I'm gonna lose work. If company B, if my customer finds out that company B is another machine shop, they're gonna find out they're better than us or they're cheaper than us and I'm gonna lose it. Can that happen? Yes. But if you're passing something on to another shop instead of doing it yourself, it probably means they have some kind of capability or some kind of specialization that you don't have. You know, when I get a crazy five axis part that comes across my desk, I pass it on to other shops that I know I trust and I pass it on to them who have great five axis capability. In return, they tend to send me stuff that's more suited for three axis or four axis or turning, or you know, maybe they only do prototypes. So they'll send me production. Or you know, with my laser cutter. Now, you know, I've sent enough laser stuff onto them. We talk a lot. You know, I still get work done by them myself. Now, when they have laser parts that they need, you know, machine features on, they send it to me. So it turns into a situation where everybody helps each other. And you know, the rising tide does lift all ships. And besides that, the other big benefit to it is I want this vendor to exist. Like I said, I don't want to have a laser cutter or I don't want to have an anodizing line in house. I want that vendor to be successful because I want to keep using them because I like their service. So if I can put work their way, it's not going to hurt me. It's going to help me because I know that vendor is going to exist. I don't know if any of you guys have had one of your key vendors shut down before. It's brutal. You know, I had a powder coater that we used for years that was amazing. Pricing was on point. They were quick. They were just a great company. And you know, the one guy who owned it ended up moving out of the country. That company folded just going to find the new power powder coater and testing them out and going through, you know, oh, this guy actually can't do this kind of part. Or this guy has a lead time of six months for some reason and he's telling me three weeks and then I get a part in six months. You want your vendor network to be there for you when you need them. So giving them work and developing that, na that manufacturing network is actually gonna come back and help you as well. As all, in any case, guys, I'd like to know what do you do with RFQs like this that cross your desk? You know, when it's a scenario where it doesn't really have anything to do with your shop, you know, maybe you're a laser shop and it's mill work. Maybe you're a mill shop and it's turning work. Maybe it's welding and it's outside of what you do. What do you do in this scenario? Do you pass it on? Do you just pass and walk away from it? Or do you try to take it on and mark it off? I'd love to know in the comments below because we can all learn from each other here. As always, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care.